morning, boys and girls. It is time for our children's story. So if you identify as a young boy or young girl, you can come up here for a story. Yeah, you can stay, Grant. It's okay. Good morning. Wonderful. You better crowd in here close. I'm going to show you a picture here on my phone here in just a moment. But happy Sabbath to each one of you. It's good to see you. I've seen a few of you this week at school. And uh, it's nice to see you here at church this morning too. How many of you have a pet? That's good. We have a couple of pets at home. We have a cat that my son, he he called it Sky. He wanted to call it Sky after one of the members off of Paw Patrol. And we have a recently a new member of our family. We have a little bunny that we, uh, we haven't named it yet which uh, it's still up in the air, what it will be called. But we'll call it Fluffy for this morning. We also have two other pets that are a little bit bigger, that they don't fit inside the house. They stay outside in the paddock, and one is brown and one is white. Can you guess? A bear. A bit, not a bear. A sheep and a goat. Not a sheep or a goat. Um, no. Horse. horse, that's right. We have two little... Not really horses, but more like ponies. They're really oversized dogs. And uh, we love these little ponies dearly. Now, we have uh, a white one, or if you're a horse, you would call it a a gray. That's my wife. She calls it. It's a gray. And um, its name is Maddie. And the other one is, is brown, and its name is Callie. So here's our two little ponies right here. So you can see which one is Maddie, which is the white one. And the brown one is Callie. Oh, did it? Oh, it went dark. Okay, there. You see those? So I want to tell you, this story is fresh off the press. This just happened. This just happened this morning. Is that in the morning, as it's important, when you check on your animals, you make sure, what do they need to have? Water and food. That's right. So we make sure the cat and the bunny and so on and the horses... And I got up real early this morning, and everything was as it should be. But sometimes when you hurry and getting ready for church, some things can happen that are unexpected, and something very unexpected happened. As I was getting ready to get for church, I was picking out my pants to put on, and my shirt, and my tie, and my little girl came up to me, and she wanted to have a little hug, a little cuddle. And I picked her up, and we were having a chat, looking out our bedroom window, And we saw in the paddock the white horse, Maddie. And it was running around frantically. And I said to Katie, oh, look at that silly horse running around. Now, my wife, she was staring nearby, and she could hear Maddie making a funny sound going, and this high, shrill sound. Now, my wife, she can speak horse, and she understood what was going on. She says, Callie... Well, she can't really speak it, but she knows more about horses than me. She says, Callie must have gotten out last night out of the paddock, and Maddie is upset. She's lonely. And this is before my wife had even seen the horses yet. And so we hurry and go downstairs, and sure enough, Callie, the little brown horse, is nowhere to be found. So I start quickly walking around. I hadn't put my suit and tie on yet. Walking around to see, oh, where could this little horse have gotten? And we'd walked the perimeter of the paddock and nowhere, no, we checked all the nice green grassy places that it might be. And nowhere to be found. And so my wife says, I'm going to walk through the paddock and just check and see. Now through our paddock, we have a creek that runs through our paddock. And as my wife is walking through and I have the children with me out along the road, she says to me, Jordan, come quick. So I quickly, I put the children over inside the yard uh, where they could see us safe. And I ran down to where she was by the creek. And there was poor little Maddie stuck in the creek. 
Now, she was wedged up between the bank and a log, and she was trying to get up, and she couldn't, and she wasn't looking very happy. She was quite wet. And uh, so I got down there beside Maddie, and I put my arms around her, and I said, Maddie, we can't go this way, because you're not going to get up this way. The bank is way too steep for you. And Maddie was insistent, she, or uh, sorry, Callie was insistent she wanted to go up the steep bank that way. And I said, you're not going to get up. And so we just sat there and petted her and talked to her gently and quietly. And I prayed. I said, Lord, can you help us get Callie out of the creek? And so we gave her one last hug. I said, all right, Maddie, you need to, Callie, keep mixing up the horses, the brown horse. You know the one I'm talking about. The one that's stuck, right? I said, you need to listen to me, and I'm going to guide you out this way. And I said, Maddie, uh, you need to turn around. So I grabbed her by her neck gently, and I started to lift her up out of the mud, and I said, here, come this way. And she got up, and she spun around, and sure enough, she followed me. Now, it wasn't a way that looked obvious for the horse to get out, because that way there was other logs and things in the creek, and it didn't seem like a logical way for a horse to climb out of the creek said, you need to follow me, Matt, uh, Callie, you need to trust me. And sure enough, we got her out, and then we noticed that the only way to get past was there was this big log that was across the creek. So I quickly ran up to the house, and I got my chainsaw. I don't usually, I've never ever used my chainsaw on a Sabbath morning, but I thought it was important this morning to do so. And I fired it up, and I cut the log in half so that the horse could escape, and we were able to lead Callie to safely this morning. Now, it was a very valuable lesson I learned this morning from our dear little horse. Is she thought it was the right way to get out of the creek up that steep bank, and she was never, ever, ever going to get out on her own power that way. But until she surrendered, and you could see it in her body language, she said, okay, I trust you. And she trusted us to let her guide her safely out of the creek, and now she's dry. We scraped all the water off of her wet fur. We fed her some, some warm food and put a blanket over her. And she's now she's quite happily, and that was the picture I showed you, she's happily back with Maddie in the paddock. And sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we even sin. But you know what? If we pray to Jesus, he can help us to overcome those sins, and he can help us out of our little messes that we sometimes make in our life. You can back to your seats. Good morning, church family. A little bit of wet weather we've been having, but it's a blessing. Showers of blessings that come from our Heavenly Father. As he does, he causes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. He is not partial, but he is loving, and he's, his goodness is everlasting. And it's shown to each and every one of us. And I'm just thankful to be in his house and to worship with you today. You know, a few years ago, there was a lot of uh, hype in the news about... Um, Somalian pirates hijacking ships. And um, I read, I don't know if this is completely accurate, but over that, we don't, we're not hearing so much about it now. They seem to uh, have somewhat of a, uh, a cap on it. They've been patrolling and helping to survey those waters a little bit more to keep those waters safe for tankers to pass through. But still, pleasure crafts and things are still being hijacked to this day. But... Um, I think over a period of about 10 years, somewhere around 7 billion pounds in uh, money for, uh, what's that kidnapping fee? What's that called? Ransom. ransom, that's the one. The ransom, that's how much has been spent over the last 10, 15 years in uh, buying back these ships to, from these Somalian pirates. The reason I tell you this is that up the planet that we live on the today, it has been hijacked as well. And this happened 6,000 years ago in the creation of the world, 
when Adam was created as dominion and the ruler of our planet, he was to have dominion and, and rulership here. And when he and Eve surrendered to the authority of Satan, when they questioned God, when they disregarded God and his law and his word, that they surrendered that kingship, that authority, that rulership over to Satan. And we can see the effects in the, of, of Satan's government in the planet around us today. The, the lawlessness that abounds, the broken families and broken homes and, and heartache and ruin is because of the lordship that we've surrendered our planet to. But praise God that Jesus did not leave us in such a state as this. And as we get into a few scriptures this morning, I'm going to be very brief as we have a very special uh, program this morning with communion. I want to just offer up one more word of prayer. So please bow your heads with me. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you will come and speak to us as we study your word. We need to hear new and uh, important messages that speak to our heart from you, from your word. So please open our minds, tune our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 speaks about when sin entered our planet. Romans 5 verse 12 and then we're going to go over to Romans 8. We're going to hit a few verses here really quickly. Romans 5 verse 12 it says, Therefore... Just as through one man's sin entered the world, that is, through Adam's sin, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death has spread to all men because all have sinned. It's interesting, when you read Romans chapter 5, you can almost interchange, you can interchange the word sin and death. They're, they're, they're the same, they mean the same thing. That death has spread to all, that sin has spread to all because of that first man's sin. That we as human beings, by nature, we are sinful beings. And if you jump down to verse 18, it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Again, speaking of what Adam did at the start. But even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. So through the one act of Christ coming to our planet, living a sinless die, de, a life, and dying as our substitute on that rugged cross, through that one righteous act, righteousness, the free gift, has been given to all. In verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. By nature, we're sinful beings, but Christ, he has paid our debt, and through his death and his life, he has paid our sin, but also showed us a better way. Amen? He has given us the example of his life, and that is what he has called us to. But you might say, well, how, you know, Jesus, he lives, yes, a sinless life, but that's impossible for me. How could I live a sinless life? Didn't Jesus have an advantage over us being the son of God? If you go over to Romans chapter 8, and we'll show you by the means of which he had overcome sin. And in Romans 8, and in verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, you do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, when God created Adam in the beginning, there was no sin, there was no suffering, there was no years of degradation that was on the face of our planet or in our human nature, but Adam was perfect. But when Christ came to our planet, he did not come as such, but he came like one of us. Came with the liability, with even the possibility of falling. But he came, and he took that risk to meet us on our level. And this is what I love about our commander-in-chief, is that he comes and he meets us at our level. 
to show us an example of how to fight in the trenches, how to overcome sin, how to overcome the snares that the devil throws at us. If you go over to Matthew chapter 4, a very pivotal chapter in the Gospels, when Christ was tempted in the wilderness. You see, the prince of this world, the devil, was combating it out with the king of the universe. Because what Jesus was doing was he was setting his stamp back on this earth saying, you know what? Even though this planet has, fall, has fallen, it is still possible to follow God's law and to be happy. It is still possible to love God and be loved by God and be completely safe. And in Matthew chapter 4, it says in verse 1, And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. In verse 2, And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights after he was hungry. Jesus got hungry. Are you hungry? I get hungry. I'm hungry right now. Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, was hungry. And this is when the devil begins to tempt him. And he says, now when the tempter had came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now, mothers, have you been ever tempted to go home and to just snap your fingers and supper's on the table? <laughs> now, that's something you're, not, you're tempted with because it's not within your ability but what I want you to notice here, even in this temptation, and even where Jesus might even have been justified in producing some food magically, miraculously for himself to, to take away this hunger, he did never perform a miracle for his own benefit. Because he did not want to have an advantage over you. That he came and he was tempted and tested in all points, just as we are to show us that by clinging by faith to his heavenly father, we can have victory. And what does he cling to in verse 4? He says, and it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His greatest need wasn't food at that point, but it was trusting God, trusting his word, you know, and I think it might be easy for us to rationalize at times that, you know, it might be more convenient to maybe push God aside or to do what's more convenient, even if, it dis if we have to disregard God's word. But Jesus, living a life of example for us, he said, you know what? No, the most important thing is my walk with my heavenly father to not push aside his commands, not to push aside his will, but to see surrender to that. And quite literally, Jesus was willing to starve to death. Putting aside his own bodily needs, saying, I will trust my heavenly father. And moments later, you know, there's a few other temptations, but angels came and ministered too. And often in our darkest moments, the devil will hit us the hardest, but if we cling on in faith in those darkest moments and in those fiery furnaces of life that we experience, it is then and it is there that we, like the three Hebrews, can stand in that furnace and we can be the closest with Jesus. And we'll read a passage from uh, actually a book, one of my favorite books. I've inspired some of our young people to read it. It's called The Desire of Ye Ages. And I inspire each of one of you to read it. But this is speaking about the temptation that Jesus was experiencing here in the wilderness. It says, For 4,000 years, the race had been decreased in physical strength and in mental power and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities and the degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depths of his degeneration. Many claimed that it would be impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory had that Adam failed to gain. If we have in any sense a more trying conflict than had Christ, 
then he would not have been able to be our succor for us, which means our help, our, our aid in, in overcoming. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. And we have nothing to bear which he, cannot, which he had not endured. When I think of our Savior, that he came and he got in the trenches like you and I, and he met the devil not with some extra superhuman power, but the same advantages that you and I have is to cling to God in faith, to cling to the promises in his word. That is how Jesus had overcome the temptations that, that were thrown at him. Finally, as we wrap up this little portion, this little sermonette, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and it speaks about our marvelous master and commander here. Hebrews chapter 4. In verse 14 it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. That is, let us hold fast to the faith that which we have in him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is an interesting way to articulate this, is that it, what it is saying is that we do have a high priest who has been tempted in all points as we are, so he can understand what you are going through. As our brother was speaking last week, when encouraging and comforting one another when they're going through hardships and trials, through some sort of uh, a difficult experience, something that we should never say is, I know the pain you're going through. So we don't. We don't know the pain that you're... Well, we can say, I can see you're hurting, and I'm sorry. And we can just listen. And I just found that to be so valuable and so encouraging of how we can encourage others in those times of trial. But Jesus, he can say to you, I know the pain you are going through. I know the trial that you are going through because he has been tempted in all points as we are. But the good point and the good lesson here is without sin. So we... As his followers, we can cling to his victory. When we are weak, he is strong. And we can trust him in those moments. What a wonderful Savior we serve. I believe, well, in the past, the, the, the types of warfare were quite barbaric and then they became quite civilized and then I think they've gone barbaric again. And what I mean by they went civilized, you remember the days when they used to just march out these lines of soldiers into the middle of a field and they would draw their muskets and they would take turns firing at one another to be civil and whoever had the most men standing at the end of the battle was the winner. But it was when the English and the British from my very limited experience in New Zealand history is that when they came here and were fighting with the Maori, that they learned about trench warfare. Is that correct? Is that at, I'm going to slaughter this word, is that Rua Pekka Pekka? Is that right? I had to try the word, Rua Pekka Pekka. They learned about trench warfare where those individuals, they dug in deep to withstand the cannonballs and the assailing and learn how to, to fight in the trenches and and people from, it has shaped modern warfare to this day. Jesus was not like one of those, I hate to be direct, but not like one of those British generals that in those sophisticated wars would send their men into battle while sitting on their white horses with their white gloves and maybe saying, hey, blow the trumpet, or go do this, or fetch me a cup of tea, or whatever they would do with their fancy big hat on their head. But Jesus, as our commander-in-chief, he has gotten into the trench with us. And he has been tempted in all points, as we are. And he overcame. 
He knows what you are going through right now. He knows the struggle on your heart right now. And I invite you to cling to Jesus. And cling to the, his victory because he has overcame, overcome so that we too can have victory. Amen? At this time, I invite you to, uh, we're going to be moving into our communion service where we will start with the, the foot washing and then we'll come in and have the ordinance, the, the bread and the grape juice. And if this is your first time visiting here, I invite you, you're willing to take part. This is an open communion. If you want to just sit and watch and just try and figure out what's going on, feel free to do that as well. But the ladies will be uh, washing their feet in the, the room just across from the kitchen in the conference room. And the men will be meeting in the, in the gym. And we will meet back here and, uh, and take in the Lord's Supper. You may be dismissed. <laughs>